a little rusty with Missouri frogs because I and I've lived in Kansas for the past however many years. And I had to look it up, but I did identify them as western chorus frogs. And so I heard western chorus frogs, and I'm actually hearing them just outside our window um, today. So we have western chorus frogs here, and we have them in Boonville, and I can hear them just calling across the street. So western chorus frogs are around Harrisburg as well. Um, so we are going to practice frog calls. That will be a quiz that we have, just like we will do bird calls. Wait, why are you keeping that? We will do bird calls when we do our bird unit. Um, so that will be one of the activities that we do is frog calls. And people will walk by our classroom and be like, what are those crazy students learning? We are learning frog calls. So we are all the way to Amphibia, which is the class. Because now we are in phylum chordata. We've covered all these phylums. Now we are in phylum chordata. And now we are focusing on class. We've gone through class at Nathan, class Nathostoma, chondrichthys, and osteichthys. We will definitely do a dissection of the frog because we've got a ton of frogs back there. Um, there are a lot of frogs. So we've got more than enough frogs to do frog dissections. Um, so we will do a frog dissection on... I don't think we have reptiles or birds, so it may be our last dissection until we get to the meats, which is what you guys get. You guys get meats, biology gets pigs, and anatomy gets cats. So you guys get the meats. All right, so you do need to write the orders down because you will need to know the orders, but this is also in Google Classroom for you. So we're in domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, class amphibia, but there are three orders that we're going to focus on. Order caudata, order gymnophiona, and order anura. Order caudata is the salamanders and newts. Order gymnophiona are Sicilians, all oh, their weird animals. Sicilians, you guys know what Sicilians are? Nope. You should go to school with it. It's no, it was the guy. It was the Sicilian. Sicilian. Singular guy. The Sicilians are worm like looking amphibians without legs that live in the rainforest. They look like worms, but they're not worms. And then we have in Euros, which are the most common ones that you think about. They are frogs and toads. But you will need to know the orders Panada, Gymnophiona, and Anura. Also, I was like, you know, I feel like you see you have to do it. He posted the notes on the day. I said, what you think? I was going to be like, I don't care about frogs. Frogs are pretty neat. I'm really scared of frogs. Really? They look pretty cool inside. They have a kind of a clean dissection. Um, the minks are a messy dissection. They look like the minks are kind of messy inside.
But this is the other group that is able to come onto land. And they do a good job because they are really the transition species. They do this metamorphosis thing. They go from an aquatic um, lifestyle to a land lifestyle. So they spend half their life in the water and then the other half of their life on land. Because of this though, they need to live close to water. Amphibians have a super close association with water and they need water to survive. They cannot survive without water. Amphibians have to have water. Reptiles, not so much. Reptiles, we're gonna see, they can go farther away from water, but amphibians really need that water. They have to go back to water to lay their eggs. Now there's a couple ways they've gotten around this, like some of them can lay their eggs in puddles. Some of them in the rainforest can actually lay their eggs in like, um, oh, plants that are up in trees, called bromeliads. They can lay their eggs in little puddles in trees. Um, but they still need to lay their eggs in water because the first stage of their life is a tadpole. The other thing is they actually breathe through their skin. So 50% of the oxygen that they get is actually obtained through their skin. Their lungs are not very efficient. They don't really have the best lungs for breathing. So they have to get some of their air through their skin and their skin has to stay wet in order for this to be accomplished. They're also considered an indicator species. You're gonna learn a lot about an indicator species because that is part of your assignment that you're going to start today after notes. It's an indicator species assignment. Indicator species are animals that help scientists determine whether an environment is healthy. So it, in the case of frogs, because their skin soaks up everything around them, it's very thin, their skin is like a sponge, it's got lots of holes in it, do you think if there is pollution that their skin can choose not to soak up the pollution? No, I mean, it doesn't have a choice. If there's pollution, it's going to soak up the pollution, too. So if there is bad stuff in the water, it's going to soak up the bad stuff, too. It doesn't have a choice. And so if there are a lot of frogs and toads in the environment, then it's going to soak up the... It's going to indicate that it is healthy if there's a lot of frogs and toads.
that moisture and that sliminess makes them taste really bad. If an animal comes and eats them, that helps to protect them so they don't taste good. Bacteria resistance, there has been a ton of research on the sliminess of frog skin as far as um, yeah, medicinal exactly properties and how their antibacterial properties of a frog skin can be used in medical research. Um, also, the wetness of the skin helps them absorb oxygen better so they can breathe better. So lots going on in their skin. They have chromatophores, and we have heard the word chromatophores before, talking about the octopus and the pigment coloration in the octopus and the um, squid coloration. And then poison glands. Some frogs have poison glands, think of the poison dart frog. And also on the toe here, you can see behind his eye, he's got this big bump. That's called a parotid gland, and the parotid glands are filled with poison too. So all toads have a parotid gland that's right behind their eye, and that's filled with poison to make them taste bad. Remember, poison tastes bad, so it is poison. Poison dart frogs are poisonous because you swallow it, it makes you taste bad, it makes you sick. Some poison dart frogs are so poisonous that... Um, one, like, if you get it on your skin or if you lick it even just a little bit, it can make you very, very sick. They can coat, like, the arrowhead, like the native people that live in the rainforest coat their arrowheads with it and use them for hunting. Oh, really? This is what a frog skin would look like under a microscope. These big glands here are the poison glands, and so you can see that they have a lot of poison available that would leak out to the surface. They also have mucus glands that are leaving out to the circus to make that sliminess of their skin. And then they have these color producing cells, the chromatophores that give their skin color. So again, this is the poison gland. These are the mucus glands. So the skin itself is actually really thin and frog skin is very delicate. When I worked at the zoo, we used different frogs for programs. We had a lot of animals that students could touch because that was one of the amazing things about our programs is we let the, the students touch them. But frogs were one of the ones that we did not let them touch just because their skin was so delicate. When we used the frogs for programs, they were one of our no-touch animals. There were a couple other no-touch animals such as like our owls and things like that, but frogs were one of the no-touch animals. Um, warning coloration is used for some, but camouflage is used for others. Obviously, the brightly colored poison dart frogs, they have no reason to camouflage. Why do they need to camouflage when they are poisonous? <coughs> they are toxic. They taste bad. They don't care if they camouflage because they are sending out a warning sign that, hey, I taste terrible. You don't want to eat me. I'm going to make you sick. So instead, they brightly color themselves and send out that warning color that I'm purple, I'm red. I'm blue, you don't want to eat me, so I'm going to be brightly colored instead. Um, camouflage is used by many others, and that camouflage is going to help protect them and help them to blend in. Um, another defense mechanism, and I'm sure many of you guys have experienced this one, is when you pick up a frog or a toad, the first thing they're going to do is probably pee on you. And that is a very effective technique because when they release all of that extra water they're storing, your first method to do is to what? 
Mm -hmm. When you take up a frog and it pees on you, you're going to usually chuck it. Yeah, when you're going to drop your it hands. or throw it or let go of it, you're not going to hold something that just peed on you. I'm going to kill and that thing. <laughs> so it really works. I mean, it, as a person or an animal, if something just peed on you, you're probably going to let go of it. Um, so that is a really good defense technique. And then the other thing they're going to do is they're going to puff up and make themselves look bigger. This is also effective to keep them from being eaten. When a toad puffs up its body, if a, if a snake is trying to eat it, it makes it very difficult for it to be swallowed. And maybe the snake isn't able to eat it if it puffs up. So they're not completely defenseless when they are faced with a predator of some kind. I was peed on countless times at the zoo when working with frogs and toads. Not just with frogs and toads either. Actually, elephants and rhinos. They peed on you? They tried to. Rhinos actually marked their territory by peeing towards the fence, and we actually had signs of stating that. So you were always very aware when the rhino started backing up toward the fence to turn around very good, move badly very She's such a good mom. 
to take care of her little babies on her back and then show their mommy and them. Well, that's what she is. She's a mom bus. She takes care of her little home. Well, they are. She's piggybacking and little holes on her back. And we're going to look at a picture, of course. She's so stupid. She's so stupid looking. I love her. Yeah, because they've got these little tiny heads and little legs for the fat bodies. Yeah. They're pretty cool. And kind of gross, but pretty cool. Going in. Baseball bus. Well, what is it called? Tryptophobia yeah. or something? Yeah. Tryptophobia? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you like have that, then they, they really set you off. Like that, and then uh, you notice see yeah. bugs. That's what it reminds you of. Is there an octopus? I can look at those. I can look at those. So imagine a toad with little babies in its back. <laughs> But she's such a good mom to take care of her babies that way. Well, what about Cecilia, though, whose babies eat the inside lining of her stomach? Isn't that what's nice? Unappreciated. All right, so this is what Amplexus looks like. The male grasping the female. So this way, um, the male is sure to fertilize the female's eggs. They do have external fertilization. Metamorph metamorphosis, starting at an egg, moving upwards and through the different stages. So metamorphosis is complete change. What other species have we already learned about that has complete metamorphosis? We learned about it, we caught them, we pinned them. Insects, specifically. Grasshoppers had the incomplete because they had the nymph. Butterflies. Butterflies. Butterflies had complete. They weren't the only ones with complete, like my mealworms have complete. My mealworms also have complete. Okay, here's the Suriname toad. Aren't they cute? Look at him. Is this the face? I think this is the face. Yeah, this is the face. There's its eyes and its mouth. And these are the babies. Yeah, look, see, here's a little frog in its hole. See, there's another, there's its little eyeballs, there's its nose. Each hole has a little baby in it. Isn't that cool? It's such a good mom to take care of its babies and its little holes in its back. See? Look at that. Such a good mom. Each little hole is a little egg, and they hatch, and then the little babies stay in its back. Good mom frog, or toad. Yeah, her face is so weird. This is the gastric brooding frog, which is considered to be extinct. But they had an extra pouch, they'd swallow the eggs, and then the babies would grow in their stomach, and then they'd kind of spit them out. <laughs> So all the babies would kind of be spit out. <coughs> but see, also a good parent. Take care of the babies. All right. That's all the notes we're taking today. Any questions about general amphibian stuff? Yeah, pretty old. I watched a video the other day. It was pretty old. It was about how they spade put toads in the desert. It was talking about the details of the animal kingdom, and it's cool. They were in a temporary place, and so the biggest thing, like the strongest, like the other siblings, so when the toad dried up, they were able to leave it. Ew! That's what space the toads do, because they have to do it quick before the toad dries up.